Good morning. This is uh, Tuesday, March 23rd, and today's devotion is entitled, Am I Carnally Minded? This is 1 Corinthians 3. Where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal? The natural man, or unbeliever, knows nothing about carnality. The desire of the flesh warring against the spirit, and the spirit warring against the flesh, which begin at rebirth, are what produces carnality and the awareness of carnality. In other words, those of us who are saved, and we go into disobedience to God, carnality begin to re can begin to rear its head. We understand that. But Paul is saying those who are unsaved don't get it. And if you read a little, go back a little bit to 1 Corinthians 2, he says to those that are perishing, the message of the cross is foolishness. So, if we're saved and we are reborn or born again, we get carnality or disobedience. But Paul said, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Galatians 5. In other words, carnality will begin to disappear as we walk in the Spirit. Are you quarrelsome and easily upset over small things that other people do to you? Do you think that no one who is a Christian is ever like that? Paul said they are, and he connected these attitudes with carnality. Is there a truth in the Bible that instantly awakens a spirit of malice or resentment within you? When you hear a scripture, is there a scripture or a sermon that you've heard that instantly wakes inside of you uh, anger or malice or resentment for hearing it? If so, it can be proof that you are still carnal. If the process of sanctification is continuing in your life, there will be very little trace of that kind of spirit remaining. In other words, you'll embrace the word of God. If it falls on the spot that you need to grow in, you'll receive it. Because you, you belong to God, lock, stock, and barrel. If the Spirit of God detects anything in you that is wrong, He doesn't ask you to make it right. He only asks you to accept the light of His truth about that issue, and then He will make it right. Isn't that wonderful? A child of light will confess disobedience or sin instantly and stand completely open before God. There's so much freedom there. It's like when you were a kid and you did something wrong. And you kept trying to hide it from your parents. But when it was finally cleared up, finally out in the open, and you sat down with them at the table, it felt wonderful. That's what Oswald's saying. A child of the darkness will say, oh, I can explain why I act like that. When the light shines and the Spirit brings conviction of sin on a child of light, then we need to confess our wrongdoings, our disobedience, before God and let Him deal with it. If, however, you try to vindicate yourself, you prove yourself to be a child of darkness. What he's saying is that we try to qualify any kind of sin in our life, any kind of disobedience. If God has told us not to do that, and we do it, and we try to qualify it, we look more like a child of darkness than a child of light. What is the proof that carnality has gone? Never deceive yourself. When carnality is gone, you will know it. If you've been saved a while, and I've been saved a number of years, a number of decades, actually. And I can honestly say, I can't picture myself going back and buying a six-pack or smoking a cigarette or whatever. That's what he's saying. When, when carnality has left you, you're going to know it. Because those things will make you go, I can't see myself doing that anymore. Right, even down to the smallest piece, I can't see myself disobeying God. That's carnality. So when it's gone, you'll know it. There's a freedom there. It's just so freeing inside. It's the most real thing that you can imagine. Now, again, I want you to think back to something you used to do that's so hideous now. You can't imagine yourself doing it because you love God too much. He's saying down to the finest point, can we live like that? And God will see to it that you have a number of opportunities to prove yourself through the miracle of his grace. And there's freedom there. It, that's John 8. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. The proof is in the very practical test. You'll find yourself saying, if this had happened before, I, then I would have had a spirit of resentment. In other words, if God had convicted us before about that disobedience, we'd have felt resentment for wanting to do it and Him asking us not to. And you'll never cease to be the most amazed person on earth at what God has done on you and inside of you. And what he's talking about again is complete surrender. When we are that surrendered, it's just amazing 
to, to feel the freedom that God brings inside to our carnality. And I, and I hope and I pray that we are free from that. I'm not saying making mistakes. I'm not saying that. But those things that we can look back on and say, I can't picture myself doing that now, they're markers as to how far we've grown in the Lord. So the challenge I have today is, could we celebrate God's continued refinement in our lives? And I, and I encourage you to do that. Paul said we never arrive. So we're going to be continued to be refined by God until he calls us home. Could we celebrate that? There's great joy in that. There's great joy in God working with us every single day. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, your continued hand upon our lives. How you walk with us and you steer us and you guide us. You know, it's my prayer today that uh, we would not allow disobedience to become part of who we are. We would not qualify it, but we would recognize it as your spirit would bring it to our awareness and we release it back to you and heal through it. That we would allow your spirit to continue to refine us. Thank you again, Lord, for being this concerned about us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless. I'll see you tomorrow.